but we're going to go in a lot of depth today around what's happening with the U.S. housing market, the economy, and then most importantly, what we see for the future, for the rest of 2023 and into 2024, for two reasons. Number one, so that you have insights as a real estate professional as to what's to come, and two, so that you can continue to level up your expertise. When you're talking with buyers and sellers, or you're doing your own economic updates, that's probably what I would do too, by the way, wink, wink. I would just probably steal every single thing Steve and I are going to do today, and I'd make my own content around it. And so that's the two outcomes for today. So what I hope to do today is Steve and I will go through probably 30 or 40 minutes worth of uh, content, updating you on what's going on. And then at the end, we'll open it up for some Q&A. You guys can ask Steve some questions about anything as it relates to the housing market. Um, not an open coaching call. So when it comes to the housing market, the economy, mortgages, housing, uh, we'll open that up and have some dialogue at the end. Steve, sound like a plan, my friend? Sounds good to me, sir. All right, let me, uh, I'm gonna tee this up first. So let me go here. I'm gonna share my screen and we are gonna rock and roll. All right, so a couple of key things, uh, first and foremost, all right? When we look at the housing market, um, again, this some of this will be, hey, what's happening right now? And then some of it will be our forecast for what things look like moving forward. There's a couple of key, key, key things if you're going to really focus in on this workshop and get as much as you can from it, you're here anyways, you might as well. I want to give you a couple key terms that we're going to reference throughout the workshop so that anytime we talk about a key term, you can have context as to what we're talking about. All right. The first one that is thrown around like crazy is inflation. Now, you guys hear inflation all day. You're like, Brandon, what? Yeah, so what? Well, here's the easiest way to think about inflation is it because this matters, all right? And Steve, um, if you want to add anything before I go to the next slide, please do it. But here's the thing with inflation. I want to try to keep things today as simple as possible, conceptually, so that David and Matt and all of you guys can explain this to people that don't really understand it. Because there's going to be some concepts today that you may not be 100% crystal clear on as to, uh, as an example, why is it that people in the housing market get excited when unemployment, unemployment goes up? Why people in the housing market get excited if there's a recession around the corner? Let me just pause right there and ask some of you in the chat. Does that, what I just said, confuse you? Just be honest. I'm just curious. Is it confusing why recessions would be good for people here? Wow, we got... Okay, so a couple people are so confused. Most people... All right, so some of you say some things, um, but we're going to get really get into it, all right? So the first concept, thank you for that, by the way, is inflation. Too much demand, too much money, chasing too little supply. This is the last two years that we're coming out of, right? The government printing money like crazy, giving money away like crazy. We have too much money, right? Chasing too little of supply. As a result, that equals higher prices. Really basic, really simple. This is what's happening in the housing market. This is what's been happening in the US economy until recently. The Fed's goal is to lower the prices. So everything they're doing is to lower the cost, lower inflation, right? Well, how are they going to do that? Here's the Fed's plan, right? I told you I'm going to make this super, super simple. On the left, you see this big pile of cash. This is what we've been living in the last couple of years. They want to take all of that money, a lot of it, out of the economy. We call it, or Steve calls it, demand destruction. They want to take all this dollars that are chasing too few goods and they want to rip the money out of your hands so that you have just a little bit of money. Why? So your rear end stops spending money. It's the only way the Fed can get inflation down. Steve, anything to add about my intricate Fed's plan here? No, man, that's exactly it. Simple, kind of. Yeah, it's so, so what does that mean? 
that means that the in so if if inflation is too much money chasing too little goods the the inverse of that is a recession this is the part i think a lot of newer realtors don't really get so a recession is the exact opposite it's the fed taking that money away R give me that money back how they do that they raise interest rates so you stop spending money you stop borrowing money we're taking up all the money out of the economy so it's too little demand chasing too much supply equals prices going down that's kind of where we're at that's where the fed is leading us right now they need the inverse of inflation they need this inflation to be the opposite this recession so housing market economics 101 when we talk about demand in the housing market what we're talking about is the cost of money what is the cost of money mortgages right how much does it cost to get to borrow money what is the interest rate? Supply is then simply the house, uh, uh, homes for sale, number of homes for sale. So this is the simplest way I could put this for you guys. I'm a visual creature, as you guys know. So I like making my little artwork to make this simple for you. So 2021, we had the cost of money, which again is demand. These are buyers in the, in the marketplace, had lots of money, right? Fed was just giving it away. Interest rates, if you remember, are two, two and a half percent. Everybody was borrowing money like crazy. Demand, super, 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 super high. Supply of homes, very, very low equals home prices go up more so than they ever have in the history of the earth. And home sales, 6.2 million home sales. One of the best years we've ever had in, the, uh, in, in, in history. Well, this year, we just talked about it. Fed wants to, uh, they want to destroy demand. They want to take all your buyers away from you. They're doing this on purpose so that people stop spending money. So they're raising rates. This is what you guys see in the headlines every single day. The supply of, of homes, however, has stayed the same, keeping home prices the same, but we're in a, not a housing market crash, we're in a real estate transaction crash. Home sales have dropped from 6.2 to 4 million. That's the pain you're feeling. This is the heartburn that you're feeling right now that's causing tens of thousands of realtors to get out of the market right now. Home prices are the same. The housing market has not crashed because of the supply. And then just for frame of reference, in 2009, we had the exact inverse. We had, remember what happened with interest rates? Interest rates, because we're going to talk a lot about today, recessions and unemployment and what happens to interest rates. Interest rates went down. They started pumping money back into the economy. And there was a lot of homes for sale, a ton of homes for sale, which drove prices down in 2009, right? Home prices plummeted. This is where we saw the last big housing market crash and home sales were 4.6 million. So where are we headed right now? This is what we're going to get into. So that's just a quick couple of little uh, definitions, if you will. Where are we headed right now? Well, the first question we have to ask ourselves is, what actually drives demand? What drives demand? Well, we talked about it a little bit. We said mortgage rates drive demand, yes? Then the question, Matt, becomes, well, what actually drives mortgage interest rates? And I'm curious, throw that in the chat. What do you guys believe drives mortgage interest rates up or down? Larissa says unemployment rates, jobs. What else? The 10-year bond market. Beautiful. Yep. Unemployment. So we're going to talk about that right now. Mortgage-backed securities in the bond market. So Steve, if I can just grab you now, and if yes, you could sir. just take a, take a minute to, to help people understand... Um, the mortgage-backed security market and the bond market, how those relate, and then how they're actually driving interest rates and trying to keep it as simple as possible. For sure. Let me know if I go if I go way too deep because I do that. So, uh, and just and just to touch on one thing, your your summary was really really good and really really simple. I think that one thing that you guys all have to keep in mind is is thinking of what an actual recession is. 
So, you know, a lot of times because of what happened in 2008, 2009 and 10, when all of that, that crash happened, that was a massive, massive, massive recession. Like it is called the great recession. Like there have been many other recessions that have happened that really don't look any different than your life does today. So that in that recession, we suffered a, a, a major housing market crash and a credit bubble. And then you also ran into a massive jobs loss recession. So you really had two different things happening at one time. And just keep that in the back of your mind, because, you know, you see some people that'll say, like, technically, we're in a recession because we saw GDP uh, go down two quarters in a row. Um, you can look at the inverted yield curves between the 10 year Treasury and the two year Treasury. There's all this like technical data about a recession. And so what a recession is, it's, you know, I was like reference my hair, right? It's receding <laughs> economic growth. So when inflation is growing and money is cheap and everybody's spending all kinds of money, your economy is growing. And when you try to restrict the economy and you raise rates and you make money more expensive or harder to spend, then you want the economic activity to simply recede, kind of like Steve's hair. It's not necessarily going to be a massive disaster, which might... Mine may not be the best example because it does. Like, if you're talking about hairlines and receding, this is like worst case. This is like the 2009 of that kind of receding. But nonetheless, it's still something to think about. It, it doesn't necessarily mean that all is lost or that all hell is going to break loose. So just kind of keep that in mind as you as you hear and talk about the recession, because we might have it's the National Bureau of Economic uh, Research Committee will come out at some point and be like, we entered a recession in February of 2023 based on this day. Like we can be in a recession for a very long time, but not have it declared a recession until that group comes out and says it based on some new line of data. So anyway, that's my that's my my words on the on the whole recession thing. So the next comes um bonds and MBS, right? And so mortgage-backed right. securities, which are essentially a bond, right? Or it's like a long term and, and like a 10 year treasury mortgage backed security. We use those, you can use those almost uh, as the same thing, or almost synonyms in, um, in, this, in this arena that we're talking about. And so, what those are, those are longer term, low rate of return, very, very safe investments, right? And so, you have a 10 year treasury note, right? And that's going to be considered your most safe investment that you can get because it is issued by the government of the United States of America. You, The only place you can buy those is through the government. You can buy inflation bonds, 10-year treasuries. You can buy all kinds of different things through the government, starting at a minimum of $100 up to as much as you want, depending on the type of uh, instrument it is, right? And so those, those investments provide a low rate of return but they're very, very safe. So your safest will be like the 10-year treasury or US driven debt. And then you'll have like your mortgage-backed security, which is primarily going to be like your 30-year fixed rate loan. And so what happens is the riskier these bonds get or the riskier the thing that's securing that bond is they provide, they're, they cost more, right? To, they provide a higher rate of return. So like that's why you're seeing your 30-year rates are higher than your 10-year treasury rates. And that's why we have such a big spread that we do now. So the reason though, that as inflation goes up and that we're seeing interest rates increase right now is because people in these massive pension plans, so you're like, you know, municipal funds and large bondholders and all these different things, is they put that money in there and they plan on not getting, they plan on it not coming back to them or getting to maturity for 10 years. Well, if the rate of return on that bond does not outpace inflation, so when you have a rate of return on a 10-year at 4% and inflation is going up at 7%, well, then you're actually losing money by the time that bond pays itself, becomes mature. And so what happens is by decreasing demand and taking money out of our economy, i.e. lowering inflation, is that companies in the stock markets and different things like that will start to invest less in their companies. These stocks and different marketable securities become less valuable and more volatile because people are now spending less money. 
companies are investing less money in their people. You're starting to think about some job loss. People are going to naturally go to a safer investment. As they go to that safer investment, there's more buyers now for that 10-year treasury and these bonds, these mortgage-backed securities, and there's more demand. You can provide a lower rate of return because there's more liquidity in that market. So that's why during a recession or during these times, we start to see rates come down. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Uh, there's there's more nuance and more context, right? So that's step one. So we're talking about where we're going, okay? This is the part that David and Matt, I want everybody to really understand. So Smuts is like, my head hurts. All right, so we're gonna, we'll simplify this, I promise, okay? I promise. So when we, when we start to look ahead, one of the places we have to look at is to ask ourselves, okay, both of these markets, right? The 10-year and mortgage-backed security market, is looking to the looking to see what the Fed is doing. That's why Steve and I pay so close attention to these Fed meetings, not always from what Jerome Powell and the Fed do, but what he says that impacts the market. So the next question when we're trying to uncover, okay, well, where are we going? Well, we have to figure out, well, wh what, is the, what do we believe the Fed is going to do next? So Steve, if you could take a second, just catch the group up on, all right, here's, remember the Fed's goal is to get us down to 2% inflation. That's their goal. We know that is their goal. Can you walk us through what we can expect to see from the Fed moving forward? Will they raise rates? Will they start to lower rates? Will we pause? What do you think will happen moving forward? Good question. And, and I promise this will be much more simple than that last part, because that is like kind of the technical thing and where it all comes from. So what what we're going to see going forward from the Fed is in, in what we're seeing right now. So if you guys have, have paid attention, I know some of you do. Uh, where's Is it William Rojas? I see yes. you on, the, on, on social media talking about that CPI report. So CPI, that's consumer price index. That's the price we pay for goods. And that is the Fed's favorite measure of inflation. And so that peaked in June of 2022 at 9.1%. So that means the stuff that you buy is going up 9% every year, right? And the goal of the Fed is to get that to 2%. That is a normal inflation growth rate. So the reason we've seen a lot of celebrating recently, especially this week, is because the Fed, the CPI report came out on Tuesday, and we saw that number go from, um, I believe it was 37 to 3.2% on our headline CPI number, uh, which is amazing. That was a really, really big step in the right direction. Uh, today, we saw PPI, which is called producer price index. So it's the same thing, except for it's what companies pay. And that typically leads into next month's CPI. And so that one, while you don't see any of the headline numbers or growth rates or anything like that, they don't really matter as much. Uh, we're under 2%. So you're going to start to see these things continue to decrease. And so going forward, and what the Fed has said in their last few meetings is, look, we are we are going to continue to watch the data. Uh, we're not going to be nice about it. We're going to say, like, when, when Jerome Powell speaks and they do their things, he's like, we are going to stand up to inflation. It, we may still raise rates. We are absolutely 100% committed to getting inflation to 2%. When they say that, they're referring to the consumer price index. And so what they're looking for is we saw um, a much more tame jobs number. We've seen much better numbers on inflation growth rates. And we're starting to see a decrease. We've seen the 10-year uh, treasury, which we were just talking about, has come down about 50 to 60 basis points. And so what the Fed is going to be looking for is more of this. So there's been some blips along the way, like there's been a lot of ups and downs, but generally we're starting to make our way down lower in mortgage rates. But the big thing that the Fed is watching for is just consistently going, like, we, they, like it doesn't have to fall off a cliff. What they're looking for is just continued slowing of the labor market. We'll get into why that matters in a minute. And they're also gonna look for the continued decreases in the consumer price index. And they're also gonna look for continued decreases and how much money Americans are spending. So we get another report a little bit later this month. If you guys are tuned into some of this stuff, it's called the Personal Consumption Expenditures. It's called PCE, but that's another one they'll be watching closely. So they're really watching for these things to consistently, to continue to move in the direction they are right now. Yeah, so um, 
remember how we started off the workshop. The Fed's goal is, is demand destruction, okay? So when we talk about in terms of, from a contextual standpoint, you know, we talk about here's what we're seeing. And when we talk about things being a good thing, what the Fed's looking for is for unemployment rate to go up. I know it's counterintuitive. I know this is a difficult concept. So, so we talk about like, wow, this is a great, hey, great news. Unemployment is up. You might be like, well, why is that such great news? More people are losing their jobs. Why is that a good thing? Well, because remember the goal of the Fed. The Fed is to take money away from the economy, which uh, a, a sign of that is people losing their jobs, uh, people getting laid off. They're trying to get the prices of things to be lower. The way we're going to do that is by taking money away. Now, let me just explain something for a second. All right. So let me share this. I want to I show you guys something. So when we look at unemployment as an example, and what you're looking at right now, when you look at these dark lines going up and down, these all represent uh, recessions going all the way back to the 40s, okay? But we're not going to go back to the 40s. We'll just go back to the Great Recession of 2008, 2009, right? So you can see this, this line, okay? So as unemployment goes up, typically that is a sign that a recession is literally right around the corner, right? You could see unemployment's the white line. White line goes up. That means that we're in or headed towards a recession. Well, why is that important? Remember, the Fed is, what I have said is, the Fed is putting us in an, into a voluntary recession because that is the way they're measuring to what, uh, what they're doing, is it working or not? When we look at mortgage interest rates, this is the key, 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 key takeaway. Same thing, right? These dark gray lines represent recessionary periods, okay? You have the pandemic, you've got the Great Recession of 2008, 2009, uh, you've got the recession of 2001, this is like the dot-com bubble, that whole thing. Look at what interest rates do every single time after a recession. So going back to 1975, recession, mortgage rates go down. Recession, 1980, mortgage rates go down. 1982, recession, mortgage rates go down, so on and so forth. The only time that was uh, inverted, right, was this pandemic, but the same thing happened. We had our pandemic-induced recession, mortgage rates plummet to all time lows, right? We start printing money, giving money to anybody and everybody who wants it. And now the question is, where are we going? Remember, where are we going? Well, we're headed towards a recession. Why is that a good thing? Well, if we go back to how we started this off, when we get into a recession, when you start to think about Fed rate cuts, before you say anything, Steve, I want to see if anybody's learned this yet. Why would a why would the Fed, what, what would the Fed be trying to do if they were to cut rates in the near future as, a relate, uh, as it relates to the recession? I want you to raise your yellow Zoom hand and I'm going to unmute you and see if you've learned anything yet. And not all at once. Yeah, increased spending. Gigi's just hit it. It's real simple. Yep. So, so, so they're saying, okay, let me just destroy this demand for a little while. Let's bring everything back down. And then when things get really tough, right? Mortgage rates will start to come back down. Then they say, okay, well now we can start to lower rates to get people spending money again. So uh, Steve, speak to that a little bit. And if you wanna go a little bit deeper, you can. Sure. So the, you know, it's interesting actually, they had um, today, so I'm gonna get into the labor market in just a second and I'll explain that, why, that, yeah. why we wanna see that. But, um, okay. interestingly enough, like, so there's all kinds of like betting pools out there and they actually are showing today for the first time, it went from a 14% chance of a rate hike in the March fed meeting, uh, until the CPI report came out this week, it actually turned into a 30% chance of a rate cut in March, which is way earlier than anybody's expecting it. But it's interesting that that, that that is starting to enter into the dialogue. Um, but and we'll get more into the cuts in a minute, but the as far as the labor market goes, you guys have a lot of questions surrounding that. So in, in the Fed's mission to stop people from spending money, the reason that we watch a lot of the labor market is you have to think about what companies do 
when they stop, when, when their earnings are down and when they, when people stop spending money at these major corporations, right? So they bonuses and hours get cut. Uh, you start to see some wages get cut, benefits get cut, and then you see job layoffs, right? So you, that's why you watch the unemployment report, because that's really the sign of like, okay, that's, that's like the last, it's the very last indicator of that we are heading into a bad space, right? Is when you watch that, the unemployment claims. When you look at the unemployment rate, and that comes from that we get that report the first Friday of every month, and that's how many jobs are created. Well, when you look at how many jobs are being created, they look most of these jobs right now are second, like part time jobs, sometimes third jobs, and for jobs that are for people that are over 55 years old. So rather than getting citizens and Americans to stop spending money, these people are just going out and getting another job. And so the reason that's not a healthy thing is because if if the Fed can get inflation to 2% and you have a normal labor market where wages are growing at, you know, two and a half to three percent, wage growth and inflation should eventually even out to where your household can manage that inflation without making any significant significant changing changes, still being able to save money and still being able to live a normal lifestyle. The reason that the Fed wants these jobs to stop being created and for some of these people to lose these jobs is because rather than changing their spending habits and adapt to what the Fed is doing, people are just going out and getting more and more and more jobs. So you have that second and third job, the part-time job, like that is like 80% of the jobs that we've created in the last 12 months are not full-time 80 to $90,000 a year jobs. These are part-time jobs that we're creating. And it's just not sustainable. Even if, even if they kept doing that and that worked for people, it's not a sustainable lifestyle. It's not a healthy way for people to maintain their bills. And that's why the Fed is looking at unemployment reports and they're looking at job loss reports. So they, they don't want a massive jobs loss recession. However, if that's what it takes, then they're okay with it because they need to get it through to people like, hey, you have to stop spending money. Otherwise, the prices of these goods are never going to go down. And it's it's important to remember, and, and a lot of times this is forgotten, especially when we look at these growth rates of inflation, is that inflation is not, is not a, an up and down thing. It's cumulative. So where inflation was 9% in June of 2022, and inflation is 3.2% today, those are the growth rates. So we grew 9% in June of 2022. And that didn't go down to 3.2. No, we're just growing at 3.2% on top of 9%. Great so point. that's why the Fed is so concerned with making sure that people are not taking all these extra jobs just to cover their expenses rather than actually just changing some of their spending habits. Great point. Great point. So hold on, let's clarify something because uh, there's just a little bit of confusion still. Why? So, so unemployment is one of the last um, metrics that the Fed looks at. Because go back to what Steve just said. You know, so what happens is the Fed says, okay, let's let's raise rates to get these companies to stop borrowing money, get people to stop spending. The first thing these big companies do, they don't just start laying people off left and right. No, they just start cutting back on hours. So we saw that a couple months ago. That was the first sign that the Fed saw. It said, okay, Fed's like, nope, that's not enough. We have to continue to do more, 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 and more. The unemployment rate is the last economic factor that the Fed's looking at. So it's a byproduct. So I think I saw Gigi's question. She said, and we'll go, we're going to open this up for Q&A so we can get into it uh, in greater detail. But I think the question was, um, and I lost it in the chat, but, but unemployment is one of the last things that will determine if what the Fed is doing is working. Uh, you want to just expand on that, Steve? I was actually looking at Gigi's question. So she said, so let me get this right. Fed wants to decrease spending now to lower demand and turn turn around and reopen spending as a goal to simmer the demand. So it's kind of funny. So have you ever heard the phrase like the boom and bust cycles? So that's, unfortunately, that's that's the world that we live in uh, right now with the way monetary policy is handled in our country is we do boom and bust cycles. And so, you know, during the, the pandemic, 
you, you have to go back and think about, you know, some of some of that time. And we can like it's not a political debate or like this should have been done or that should have been done. But there were massive, massive spending packages that we all heard about. Right. Like the um, like the one point three billion dollar stimulus package and things like that. And you think about the amount of money that was put into the economy that we're trying to work <laughs> out of the economy. So even if people were like, I, I was use the example, I had a neighbor and he worked full time for General Motors and he had like $150,000 a year job that he did remotely. But they had seven kids who were all being remote schooled because schools were closed during that time. But between his kids and his wife and their tax filing and how all that worked, they ended up with like $52,000 in stimulus money. And from those different stimulus packages, I remember they got a jet ski and a van, which I always <laughs> laugh because they had like seven kids in one jet ski. I'm like, how does that work? Like that would be the worst camping trip I've ever been on. But like, and that was just one case. Those were people that just used it for how it was supposed to be used. They weren't like taking advantage of those stimulus packages. So you, yes, we are trying to get people to stop spending money, but at the same time, there was so much money, like record amounts of money put in our, into our economy that it's kind of allowed people to continue to spend money like this. And it's also allowed businesses and employers with different um, employment retention credits and PPP loans. And it's it's put a lot of money in the pockets of these businesses. And so a lot of this money and a lot of the way that they're paying these people right now is still a byproduct of some of the stimulus that these companies benefited from. And so, yes, yeah, some of these jobs in a normal market would not be supported by the actual sales and the revenues that these companies are producing. So, yes, it is. It's, it's crazy, Gigi, that you'd want to like get people to stop spending money and make them lose their jobs and then stimulate them to get their jobs back. But unfortunately, you have to right the ship after you have all of that money and that kind of that unique scenario where we put all that cash into people's pockets. Yeah. The hard part is getting people to change their habits. And that's and that's where we're really stuck because if you're like me or anybody else during that pandemic, I mean, it was like, that was the first time in our history in the United States, really, I mean, at least in my lifetime that we were told we couldn't do anything, don't spend money, don't make money, don't do anything, just sit at home. And there's just, still years of pent up demand from that where people are still buying goods at record paces. Yeah. So let's, let's just pivot for a second um, and talk about what, what things look like ahead so that we've got enough time, Steve, to open this up for some Q and a. So, so let's talk about where we believe things are headed. So again, um, unemployment really quick, Steve, just, just talk about, you know, quickly how, We've been lowering inflation, but mortgage rates haven't been uh, lowering to the pace that inflation has been lowering because unemployment is is one of those last things that get affected. Just talk about that really quick because that will tee us up to what we're going to talk about next. Yeah, I mean that that is true because the the economy is just not slowing down. Another, and this isn't as related to that, but a big reason that we haven't seen interest rates move down as quickly as inflation has moved down has mainly it goes back to the supply and demand conversation of the supply of treasuries in the market. So if you guys think about like the Silicon Valley bank failure, the signature bank failure, uh, and all those different things that happen, and then you look at some of the debt deals that our government uh, enacted with um, some of those government spending plans, the treasury market has been just inundated with supply. So in the recession and during quantitative easing and things like that, you had the largest purchaser of these bonds and these treasuries were the was the Fed. They were buying like $60 billion of each a month. You know, they're buying just massive quantities of these. So not only have they stopped buying those, but they're letting the ones that mature roll off their balance sheet where in the past they would reinvest and buy more with their gains. They've also had these companies like your uh, your Silicon Valley Bank and all these places that have had to sell their treasuries at heavily discounted rates. And so there's just between that and the the fear that the Fed is going to continue to keep rates high because people are still getting jobs and spending money. Nobody's getting back. There's just not enough liquidity or not enough uh, demand in that bond market to see the prices of those bonds go down yet. So 
we're getting there. And to, to answer your question, you know, how does employment factor into that? It's like I said before, is that the goal of everything for the Fed to lower the rate and to stop being so restrictive is just to get people to stop spending money. The way you get people eventually when it's when the economy is as resilient as it is to get people to stop spending money you just have to take the money away from them and unfortunately that's right that's a job that's a job loss recession now as we start to go forward and we start to look at some of the forward rates we're going to we should continuing on this same path we'll see the bond market start to have those prices come down naturally it won't take necessarily the biggest gains that we get in interest rates are not going to come from necessarily the Fed saying we are ready to cut rates or actually the act of cutting rates. It's going to believe be a couple of different things. It's going to be one, the bond market realizing that the Fed is officially done and the Fed having just a little bit brighter tone or a more dovish tone on inflation. So that'll be the first thing that happens. As that 10-year yield comes down, we'll start to see the interest rates move down. The second piece of this, and this is getting into more of the nuances and a little bit deeper, is that right now, the difference between the 10-year Treasury yield, which I think right now is at 4.6, is it 4.6% right now? Or 4.55% right now, is the spread is usually one and a half to two or 150 to 200 basis points above the 10-year Treasury is where your mortgage rates for 30-year loans typically trade. Right now, we're trading at about 300 basis points above the 10-year Treasury. So as the economy and as the Fed starts to become more dovish or more happy about inflation, not only will you see the 10-year Treasury continue to decline, so you'll go down from that 4.55, you're also going to see that spread get more narrow. So you're going to get that you're going to get these changes or the improvement in mortgage rates from two places, from one the 10 year treasury yield going down so 4.55 and realistically rates are about seven and a half today and as you start to see that 300 basis points or three percent spread between those two decrease like if you think about it if we we're in a normal economy or a normal cycle right now if you were two percent above what the the 10 year treasury is we'd be at like a six and a half percent rate the reason that we have that big of a spread in there is because the Federal Reserve simply won't say that they're comfortable with the economy and the rate of inflation going down the way it is, or that they're comfortable with saying that the employment growth rate is starting to slow down enough to where they can look at easing some of their policy. Until they say that, we won't see that spread change. But once they do, or once they say, we may look at lowering rates in May, you will see very quickly that spread start to soften between the 10 year and the 30 year fixed. And that will see, you'll see a rate decrease from that. You'll see the rates also start to move down with the lowering of that 10 year treasury yield. Yeah. So that's why many, 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 many economists thought that by the end of this year, we'd already be in the mid sixes on a 30 year fix based on that spread. That's where they thought we would be. We haven't seen this before. No one saw this before. So what we're looking at, number one, I would write down December 13th. This will be the third time that the Fed will most likely pause and not raise interest rates. That will be massive. Uh, and so that's number one. Number two, as a result, unemployment, because it's the last thing to go, right? It's like the final strategy the Fed has is just what Steve said. It's like, okay, if you're not going to stop spending money, we're going to cut off your money supply and we'll just make you all lose your jobs. As unemployment rates, okay, they, you could just uh, Google it, but the unemployment rate comes out, what, the first of every month, is that what you said? First Friday of every month. First Friday of every month. So we're looking closely at that for that unemployment rate to go up yet again. These two things are what we're looking at, and everybody believes that two things will happen. One, the Fed is going to pause, meaning on December 13th, they're not going to hike, they're not going to raise, um, they won't lower, but their tone will start to change, is, is what Steve uh, is saying, or that's what we believe. Number two, we also believe that unemployment will continue to go up as the jobs report comes out and there are less jobs being created, more people losing their jobs. 
That is what is most likely going to happen. As a result of that, okay, this is what I want you guys to see. This is what I want you guys to know from today's webinar, if I can get back to where I am. This is where we expect things to, to look like, okay? And then we'll open this up for some Q&A. So the first quarter of next year, we have MBA saying that we should see rates in the high sixes. Fannie Mae says, hey, we'll be right around 7%. And then NAR saying, hey, we'll, be, we'll all, the, all the way be down almost 6%. They have us at 6% all year next year. I think that's pretty ambitious. But the average of all three of these organizations and the economists that, that, uh, that work for these companies is that rates next year will be in the mid sixes. As a result of them being in the mid, mid, mid sixes, this is then that demand increasing that we have none of right now. That all these people that have been on the sideline at 7.5%, 8% interest rates get off the fence, those people that want to sell. As a result of that, this gets more people buying homes, which then will get us into a situation where we come off of 4 million houses sold. This is why you guys have so much heartburn right now. And we're, we should get over 5 million home sales next year again. That's a million more sales next year. That's 2 million commission checks addition to what we have this year. This is a massive drop-off. We haven't seen a 35% decrease since the Great Recession of 2008. We haven't seen it since then. 2023 was a really, really tough year for real estate agents. We got our faces kicked in because the Fed destroyed the demand. We haven't seen interest rates go up that high that fast ever in the history of the world. As a result of that, home prices should go up yet again. Nothing crazy. They should pretty stay pretty flat, uh, but they should go up about another point or two. This is what we... So this is what I keep trying to tell you guys is if you many, many, many believe there was a bunch of economists that came out today, Steve, I don't even know if you saw it, that believe that we have uh, finally started to crest, meaning the worst is behind us. That if you've gotten to this point, that things moving forward will start to just get better and better and better and better and better and better. If you have uh, weathered the storm, so to speak, most economists say the worst is now in our rear views when it comes to mortgage rates, all of that that we just talked about. So for all the real estate agents that hung in there, all the mortgage people that hung in there, 2024 should be a, a good year. So Steve, any last thoughts on the forecast? And then we'll open this up for some Q&A. Yeah, so uh, the NAR one that you posted, Lawrence Yoon is a big is a big, oh, uh, yes. fan Let me of the spread. Hold on, let me let me let me please. show that real quick. I think you're going to talk about this. So, real quick, Lawrence Yoon just posted this. I just shared this. Okay, so he says mortgage rates are uh, plunging with the news of inflation calming. Consumer prices rose by 3.2 percent in September, even with the rent component. We didn't even talk about that, but that's okay. Uh, Non-official private sector rent shows zero to two percent rise. So here's what he says: the interest rates rises should be over and the fed will have to consider cutting interest rates seriously in the meantime the bond market is reacting as if the fed will be cutting interest rates next year mortgage rates look to head towards seven percent in just a few months and into the six percent range by spring of 2024 okay so that's huge 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 news sorry to cut you off steve i just want to make sure we, sh we shared that with the people yeah, and if if you read like if I like I follow him and, and read you know some of his um, some of his publications or whatever you want to call them, he's he's a big fan of that spread between the thirty year and the ten year treasury softening, um, which again is is just going to be a matter of like I I can tell you at this next Fed meeting they will pause rates uh, unless something really weird happens, and Jerome Powell will still say he will not his tone will still be. The hawkish we have not won the battle on inflation we'll continue our strict policy stance until we reach two percent we'll continue to monitor the data uh, as it comes in and that when they ask him about what we've seen recently he'll say yes we are encouraged by this data and we'll look for it to continue like he will be but that part of it we him saying we are encouraged by recent economic data is enough to to drive a rally in the markets 